So my research, uh, it's essentially about the way in which uh, the film and television industry is evolving, uh, or at least in a current state of transition as a result of the now ubiquitous use and reliance on uh, algorithms, machine learning, and big data. So more specifically, it explores the role that these technologies are now playing in the production, distribution, and consumption of film and television, um, and also kind of looks to question how these technologies might be impacting broader uh, and more abstract notions of creativity, uh, as well as taste and taste making. <clears throat> so I think uh, the general pervasiveness of algorithms is something that's fairly well known. Uh, I also think it's something that's sort of felt by the broader public, but not necessarily understood. Uh, and of course, I think these technologies now warrant, uh, uh, you know, a definite degree of um, sort of concern for society and for researchers alike. So as many of you may know, the, the functioning of entire industries is now built on top of these intricate and essentially invisible technologies. So this includes journalism, entertainment, healthcare, finance, uh, manufacturing, technology, and media. Um, and uh, the public kind of, whether we really feel it or know it or not, um, these, these technologies, are, they're becoming increasingly, or we are becoming increasingly dependent on them in our everyday practices. So algorithms, they actually sort and order pretty much all of the information we consume. Um, they encrypt and secure our personal data. They recommend us consumer goods and cultural products. Um, they, rec uh, they also predict our preferences and habits and auto-correct our errors. So media scholars, uh, Robert and Sefer in their book in 2016, go so far as to argue that there's currently no area of human experience that's untouched by algorithms. And because of this, a, a kind of new field of study has actually emerged uh, in the social sciences and humanities, which is routinely referred to as critical algorithm studies. And a majority of the research within this uh, field is focused on the capacity that algorithms have to uh, sort of produce or reproduce systems of power, governance, and surveillance. Uh, so if we think about something like political polarization in the United States, researchers of, of algorithms might uh, consider how algorithmically mediated news uh, might be contributing to this phenomenon. Uh, however, there's also a smaller sort of subset of researchers that's turning its attention specifically to the relationship between algorithms and culture. Um, and algorithms in art as well. And this is kind of where my research fits in. So researchers of algorithmic cultures, uh, they frequently question the power that algorithms have to sort, rank, and distribute cultural items, and therefore shape our cultural tastes, preferences, and practices. So I actually kind of went into this research project thinking uh, I was gonna write a paper about the power of these technologies um, and the potential danger that they may be imposing on cultural life. Uh, so in particular, I was actually concerned uh, that due to kind of like data-driven creativity, they, they may actually be now displacing uh, human creativity and the human creative process. And I especially thought about this when, when I kind of read about the way in which Netflix is sort of building entire series and screenplays uh, from the ground up, essentially using our data uh, and using kind of AI to write screenplays. Um, and then in the case of recommendation systems, uh, I was also concerned that algorithms may now actually be dictating our tastes and preferences, which uh, are things that we often hold dearly to and we see as being sort of intrinsically human and tied to our personalities. And overall, I was just concerned that culture itself was being reduced to data. Um, but of course, when I began my research, I discovered that this was already the dominant perspective in regards to studying algorithmic culture. Um, and I found that as I kind of dug deeper uh, into the topic, uh, I actually began to embrace a uh, relational ontology or what's referred to as a relational materialist approach to uh, thinking about algorithms. And I stopped viewing algorithms as being these black box technical devices that exert influence over cultural life while remaining fundamentally detached from culture itself. Again, I found this to be the dominant uh, perspective in the literature. So rather what I'm arguing today is that algorithms are now deeply entangled with culture and that they're actually cultural entities in and of themselves. And although they're exerting influence on culture life, they're, they're not actually doing so in a top-down or unidirectional manner. Uh, and then we, if we actually, or as researchers were to adopt a more open-minded perspective, 
We could even see these technologies as revealing aspects of cultural reality that would normally be invisible to us. So concepts as kind of abstract as creativity and taste, and they're making them more tangible and comprehensible through the language and logics of computation. Because of this, I end up suggesting that the critical perspective is just too deterministic, or that at least research in this field needs to create space for a more holistic approach to studying algorithms, and uh, particularly one that acknowledges that when we actually speak of algorithms or evoke them, especially in the arts and humanities, we're typically referring to this messy network of actors that actually make up their operations. So uh, as I have here, from, from a relational perspective, Algorithms are understood to be socio-technical processes that come into existence and operate in the world uh, through a complex uh, set of relations between human and non-human actors. So what this means is that they're not actually static or purely technical objects at all, uh, but they're actually sort of always evolving um, and uh, really dynamic processes that are kind of in a state of constant negotiation between the various actors that, uh, that make them up. And, uh, and to be clear here, when, when I actually refer to actors uh, within, within the sort of algorithmic network, uh, this includes things like the algorithm's code and the data structures that they work on, uh, as well as other software and systems of algorithms that, that the algorithms engage with, uh, but also like the desires of the, the programmers and engineers who construct them, uh, the motivations of the companies and institutions that deploy them, uh, obviously us, the users who provide them with the necessary input data that they need to function. Uh, and then more abstractly, kind of the broader public who, who are actually responsible for articulating and making sense of their presence. So once I started to adopt this relational perspective, my research uh, ended up taking a bit of a turn and uh, kind of had two objectives. So again, I wanted to explore the role that these technologies were playing in the film and television industry uh, and assess how they're impacting taste and creativity. But I also, I wanted to challenge and sort of push back against the dominant critical theoretical perspectives that have emerged in regards to studying algorithmic culture. So today I'm actually focusing more on my published paper specifically. So this talk's gonna focus a bit more on distribution and recommendation systems rather than production and creativity. And in particular, I'm going to talk about Netflix and its use of algorithms and tell you guys a bit about a small experiment I ran where I reverse engineered the Netflix recommender system. Um, but before I do that, uh, I also want to talk a bit about the current dynamics of the streaming landscape, uh, as this kind of provided the contextual backdrop for all of my research. So the streaming wars is a sensational title used to describe the escalating competition between video streaming services. So between November 12th, 2019 and May 27th, 2020, the industry witnessed five major media and tech companies enter the video streaming market, um, all of which were really impressive platforms with really strong catalogs of content. Uh, so during this period, what launched was Disney Plus, Apple TV Plus, NBC Universal's Peacock uh, and HBO Max. Um, and it was interesting actually, so sure enough, like as I was revisiting this topic to prepare for this presentation, uh, it was interesting to see that some of the actual predictions I was making uh, when I was writing my thesis were kind of more or less unfolding. Um, so for example, after sort of a, essentially like ceaseless dominance of Netflix over the streaming market, uh, the company just two weeks ago had fallen to be the worst performing company on the S&P 500 list. Um, the company's shares had fallen 40% since the new year and 70% since its peak in uh, November. So this is still uh, very much, um, or I guess we're still very much like in the throes of this kind of quote unquote war. Um, and it's not entirely clear which of these companies is gonna come out on top. And then in addition to these major players, there's also been a proliferation of niche streaming services within the industry. So as of late 2019, there was a documented 271 streaming services in the United States. And then adding complexity to, uh, to this landscape, there's also a parallel battle being waged between live TV streamers specifically. Uh, so companies are kind of just looking to transfer the cable viewing experience over to the internet. Uh, and these include uh, companies like YouTube with YouTube TV, 
Hulu Live, DirecTV, Sling, uh, and so on. And overall, this is, a, this is essentially given way to uh, what many people are referring to as the cord cutting phenomenon, um, where we're seeing customers are increasingly abandoning their, their uh, satellite and cable TV packages and opting for uh, streaming services. So in my actual thesis, uh, I go into some of the economic dynamics of the streaming wars uh, in a lot more depth. But for sake of time, the important thing to take away is that the film and television industry is essentially entering a new era. So historically, about every 30 years, Hollywood has undergone a major shift. So there was the transition from silent film to the talkies in the 1920s. Um, there was also the rise of broadcast television in the 1950s. And then there was the cable boom of the 1980s. Um, and all of these were actually spurred by new technological developments, uh, which themselves massively disrupted industry practices. Uh, but what I think is most interesting is that uh, all of these transitions also gave way to new kinds of creative outputs. Uh, and they actually altered the creative process uh, and they altered how we consume um, and sort of, or how content is distributed and how we consume it. So they changed the way that we kind of construct taste. So today, obviously I'm arguing that the shift is now towards uh, streaming and streaming culture, uh, which has only been exasperated by the pandemic. And, and while there's a lot of kind of elements to dissect in regards to the current streaming landscape, uh, I'm arguing that a good place to start is by first considering the technologies that uh, it has been built upon. Because I think the complexity of the streaming wars is only mirrored by the algorithmic technologies that are currently defining its parameters. Okay, so on to Netflix. Uh, so a core feature of Netflix's business and brand is the Netflix recommender system, uh, which I'll be referring to as the NRS. This is also, uh, when people say the Netflix algorithm, this is what they're actually talking about. It's this system. Um, and the system is basically a collection of proprietary algorithms used to recommend content to users uh, and basically personalize every aspect of their experience on the platform. Um, I'm suggesting today that as the streaming wars progress, recommendation systems like the NRS will become key competitive features for every major streamer. So I pretty much think that uh, in, in order for a streamer to find success in this space, they're, they're gonna need a high quality recommendation system uh, and, they're, and they're gonna need to make sort of smart use of big data. But what this means for us is that, um, you know, as the distribution of film and television uh, and therefore our consumption patterns uh, they'll, they'll increasingly be in the hands of semi-autonomous algorithmic technologies. And because of this, I think the current moment, uh, which is just before these technologies become, uh, or these recommendation systems become essentially inescapable, I think we really need to question how they work uh, technically, but also what purposes they're really serving. So in order to do this, um, I've conducted a small experiment where I've applied a scholar, Tana Butcher's method of reverse engineering uh, to the NRS. So this method of reverse engineering is far more experimental than it is technical. Uh, Butcher describes it as a process that seeks to extract knowledge about the operational logics of algorithms uh, through speculative experimentation and playing around. Um, it's very similar to the algorithmic audit uh, which again is just about finding ways to force algorithms to sort of reveal themselves, uh, usually by actually toying with the platform itself. So I have reverse engineered the NRS by setting up three Netflix user accounts with three distinct ta uh, taste profiles. Every day for two weeks, I selected one new film or show um, for each profile according to their taste. And I let that title play in its entirety. Uh, by keeping each persona's tastes sort of unrealistically narrow and focused, uh, I had intended to provoke a more extreme reaction from the NRS uh, because I thought it would be more revealing of, of how these algorithms are actually working. I then carefully recorded every change uh, that took place on the homepage. Um, and uh, that's how I der derived uh, my results. So the personas I constructed were the diehard sports fan, the culture snob and the hopeless romantic, which are uh, on the screen now. So basically when I started my experiment, 
every profile began with the same homepage. And I started picking shows according to each profile's taste. So on day one, the diehard sports fan watched two episodes of the Michael Jordan docuseries, The Last Dance. The culture snob watched Francis Ford Coppola's The Godfather. And the hopeless romantic watched Crazy Stupid Love, starring Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone. Uh, and almost immediately, things began to change. So as the experiment sort of progressed, each profile's homepage began, became increasingly personalized and recommendations became more and more accurate. For example, on day five, a row literally titled Movies for Hopeless Romantics appeared halfway down the Hopeless Romantics homepage. Uh, and I was really surprised at how quickly and accurately the NRS seemed to sort of pin down each profile's taste. So the diehard sports fans uh, profile was, was covered in sports related content. Uh, and interestingly, it had a lot of content tagged as inspiring and motivational. The Culture Snobs homepage consisted of dozens of critically acclaimed uh, foreign and independent films. And it had sort of weirder rows titled things like cerebral documentaries and hidden gems. And uh, likewise, the, the Hopeless Romantics page, it was almost the most obvious for this profile, uh, was pretty much just ruled by romance and reality television top to bottom. So one of the most noteworthy changes though was uh, in actual artwork. So in general, each profile ended up having its own kind of aesthetic feel. Uh, but what I found most interesting in regards to artwork were the differences between artwork images used for the same title across all three profiles. So uh, I didn't realize this before, but Netflix even changes these uh, and personalizes them according to your taste, uh, as you can see is the case here with Outer Banks and La La Land. So what my experiment made particularly obvious was uh, the circular and economic logic embedded in the Netflix algorithm. In order for Netflix users to experience any level of personalization on the platform, all that is required of them is consumption and interaction. Uh, interaction including things like just scrolling uh, through menus. So the more content that a user consumes on Netflix and the more time they spend interacting with the platform itself, the more data the NRS is able to extract from them resulting in more elaborate personalizations and uh, ideally more precise recommendations. In theory, this should then lead to more consumption, more interaction, more data and better recommendations and so on and so forth. The problem is that nowhere in this circular equation is it actually necessary for users to seek out uh, new, new content, search for specific titles or experiment across genres. Again, for the critics, uh, the fear here is that cult, this is a sort of prime example of cultural authority being attributed to uh, systems of algorithms. Uh, then the case of Netflix actually aimed to kind of moderate the cultural field by giving us more of the same uh, and excluding cultural outliers. However, I actually argue that when thinking about the feedback loop phenomenon, we must be hesitant to work from the assumption that the NRS is even reproducing a user's true taste in the first place. Um, and it's actually important to remember that Netflix does not sell content in the traditional sense. Uh, it actually sells itself as a platform that can be purchased for a monthly subscription fee. And what this means is that content leveraged by Netflix uh, or, con or that content is leveraged by Netflix only as a means of attracting and retaining users. Uh, they're not actually selling the content. Um, and what's really important here is retention because I think it's become the new currency of the streaming landscape. Uh, these streamers are really trying to sort of keep you in their ecosystems uh, for as long as possible for fear that you'll, you'll leave to other uh, competing platforms. So I argue that, that it's crucial to recognize that Netflix, Netflix's deployment of its algorithms uh, in order to present us with the right content is not the same as deploying algorithms to maximize user engagement, uh, which is what it actually does. Uh, and, and that the kind of fundamental thing it's doing is just equating consumption with the authentic performance of taste. So I think the concern is less that we're actually being trapped in personal feedback loops, but that we're being trapped in uh, commercial ones. As deeply embedded in the Netflix recommender system is this pure economic reasoning. So again, this was uh, particularly obvious in the case of artwork where these closed commercial loops seem to almost extend out into the entire aesthetic experience of navigating Netflix. 
Um, so for example, it was never actually clear to me how artwork customization could translate to improved user experiences. So for example, it seemed, it seemed far more misleading when the artwork image for Goodwill Hunting changed for the hopeless romantic from an image of Robin Williams to one of Matt Damon and Minnie Driver kissing. Similarly misleading uh, was the selecting of an image of surfboarders for uh, the Outer Banks, which is a show that isn't really about surfing at all, or displaying black and white images for films shot in full color, uh, which I saw on the Culture Snobs homepage. What again became clear to me was the, the economic motivations of the NRS. So these kind of personalized uh, artworks combined with lengthy homepages and rows built for endless scrolling, I think they work to create the illusion that Netflix contains an infinite amount of content that's perfect for every user. Uh, and that no matter what, you feel like you've barely scratched the surface. And I end up arguing that evidence selection algorithms, uh, which is what Netflix uses to, to customize artwork, uh, end up arguing that these algorithms, they're almost entirely tools designed to improve uh, retention rates and not actually user experiences. And that this actually makes it a prime example uh, of what media scholar Christian Sandvig has called corrupt personalization. And I think this, this concept of corrupt personalization is really important uh, because I think it's rampant across all platforms, sort of content-based platforms, including social media sites like Instagram and TikTok. Um, I think the sort of personalization we're getting from these platforms is actually a lot more manipulative than, than we realize. Okay, so my analysis of the Netflix recommender system, uh, it's actually nested in a broader sort of philosophical question regarding the tension between human and algorithmic agency uh, or humans and machines. So as a cultural intermediary um, or a gatekeeper, the NRS plays a critical role in the process of film and television taste making, uh, essentially by choosing what to reveal uh, and what to conceal from us. So it's not entirely clear if the Netflix recommender system is predicting what film and television content we may prefer or whether it's actually determining it. Uh, and it's within this kind of murky territory of locating agency where many critical rec uh, questions about recommendation systems have been raised, uh, especially in academic literature. So for the critics, the question of agency goes beyond whether the NRS is dictating what we watch to whether is a prime example of the way algorithms are now uh, actually exerting control over our artistic and aesthetic judgments. However, again, if, if we were to adopt this relational materialist approach, uh, which I'm promoting, um, we must actually reject this commonly posed dichotomy between human and algorithmic agency or uh, man versus machine, uh, especially in relation to creativity, taste, and culture, as these are equally complex and fundamentally relational entities in and of themselves. So from a relational perspective, taste, just like algorithms, is performative and transformative in nature. Um, and it actually exists in this ongoing state of revision. And not only this, but from a relational perspective, agency itself is also a distributed and mediated phenomenon. Um, and for, for those of you who are interested, I, I actually dive into this line of thinking a little bit more deeply uh, in my actual uh, piece. Um, where I find myself arguing the following, um, and I'm just going to read this uh, directly from my paper. Um, so the Netflix recommender system should no longer be positioned as an unknowable technical device capable of dictating our experience of culture, as its agency over our tastes and preferences, much like our own, remains only partial. In fact, the Netflix recommender system could perhaps more usefully be viewed and studied as microcosm for the relational, reflexive, and performative way taste operates in the world more broadly, giving these complex processes a new computational materiality. Um, so overall, uh, you guys can probably tell that I'm a little bit more interested in expanding the conversation around algorithms and connecting dots than I actually am in reaching fixed conclusions. Uh, and as a result, I think my re research has revealed, uh, definitely revealed some things that we can feel cynical about uh, in regards to these technologies. But it's also allowed me to suggest new frameworks for thinking about these technologies um, 
uh, and new ways to approach uh, studying them as well. So just a couple sort of key takeaways. Um, first of all, algorithms and big data are definitely impacting culture and they're doing so in some potentially negative ways. So for example, my experiment revealed that there's a profound commercial and economic orientation embedded in recommendation systems like the NRS, uh, which, I, which I would also assume is the case with most recommendation systems for most platforms. Um, and I even argue that the fundamental mode of abstraction used by these systems is one that turns creativity, taste, and culture into a problem that can be efficiently solved. Uh, the fear here is that as streaming becomes more dominant, notions and practices of taste will increasingly abide by these circular and economic logics. Uh, however, I, I also suggest throughout my paper that we must think carefully about the way in which these technologies may actually reflect more than disrupt the complex processes of cultural life. So the ways in which they may actually be giving uh, things that are quite abstract, like creativity and taste, um, and they're actually giving them a new materiality through the language, logics, and interfaces of, of computation. And then again, overall, I, I posit this need, especially for arts and humanities researchers, uh, to embrace a relational or holistic approach to studying algorithms, especially to avoid falling into uh, tech determinism. And I think the key point from a relational perspective uh, is that it sees the power and agency of algorithms as being inherently distributed. And I think because of this, this perspective actually allows us to move beyond what if questions, uh, such as what if algorithms are dictating our tastes. And instead it actually allows us to ask other questions, such as why do we appear to be increasingly orienting ourselves and our cultural practices towards algorithms? And how might the very meanings of creativity, taste and culture be expanding to accommodate for these new technologies. Um, and I think I'm just gonna wrap it up uh, there and, uh, and I'll invite anyone who's listening to sort of uh, think about these questions the next time maybe you're on Netflix or, or you're receiving uh, you know, algorithmi algorithmically recommended uh, content.